Welcome to the Great Girlfriends Podcast, where we discuss life, love, laughter, and everything in between. I am your host, Brandis Daniel. And I'm your co-host, Sybil Amuti. And we are so excited about our guest today. We have with us Miss Don Lyon Gartner, as you know, Charlie Bordelon of Queen Sugar. Yes! <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> Dawn, thank you so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure. What a great, what a great uh, conversation to have with you guys. Yes, before we jumped on, girlfriends, I was telling Dawn how she has snatched all of my evenings and just taken. <laughs> <laughs> she's taken all my personal time because I'm just so caught up. I'm just, I, I'm so conflicted over what everyone is doing on the show. And it's so real to me. And I'm like, oh my God, these decisions they're making, how are they going to line up? What's going to be next? And I couldn't believe you guys gave us a half season and made us wait. I was so frustrated. <laughs> I didn't know who to call at own. I was like, this is not fair. This is not fair. <laughs> I had my, uh, my family was calling me the, the first week that we were on hiatus. And they were like, where is it? <laughs> 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 they were all calling and so upset. They were so upset. So I, I, I know firsthand that that was jarring to say the least. It was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. And I, you know, but we're glad you're back. We're glad you're back, and we hate that you're going to be leaving again soon. But I see that the show has a third season. Congratulations! Thank yes. you. Thank you. We're very excited. We're very excited. So, do people? you know, see you and just automatically give you a thousand questions about Charlie. Is Don still present? You know, what's interesting is that I I think people assume, and I understand because I can make this assumption too about characters and actors is that I'm, I'm like her or that I I am her in some way. Um, And so people actually, when I'm recognized, the tendency is like, Oh, you're Charlie. And then there's actually, depending on their relationship with Charlie, there's actually, there can be a little bit of a like, Ooh, like, are you actually, <laughs> are you actually going to do some of those crazy things that you do? Or, ooh, I don't know, maybe I need to tread a little lightly around you. It's, it's fascinating to see that happen. Um, but for the people who love Charlie, they just, they can't, they are just so excited. Um, but I, I, I find that fascinating because I am so, I think in general, not like her. Just in terms of how I walk in the world, I think I... I have a different sort of openness and a different sort of sense of humor mm-hmm. <laughs> that I that I generally walk with, a different sort of goofiness that I can walk with. Uh, at the same time that I say that, I do also have to own that I can be very mission driven, very mm-hmm. um, very about sort of very very extremely focused, very ambitious. Um, so there are parts of her that are sharing, there are parts of her that I feel like. They're, they're a stretch for me, but they've been a very good stretch and sort of a good education for me at the same time, you know? Wow. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. So tell us about Dawn, the woman. Who is Dawn, the woman? Who's Dawn, the great girlfriend? Who is she? You know, I, I was literally just having this conversation. Dawn, the woman, is someone who's really driven by vision and driven by vision, not just for herself, but for the world, for society for just the greater good. It sounds cliche, but that's, that's at the base of it. That's, that's sort of how I walk in the world. And choosing to be an actor was a part of that. There was a time when I was in school that I was deciding between leaving school to pursue becoming either an activist or going to school for something that would, that would have to do with that or staying in school or, or staying on the path of becoming an actor. And I made the decision to, to stay and, and to stay at Juilliard and to, to pursue acting because it felt like it felt like like that was actually my way, my path of affecting change, of doing what I wanted to do in activism, which was to activate. Mm-hmm. I didn't see activism as a fight, which I think some people can see, can feel like a war, can feel like a fight. And that that was part of my decision was that that that's not that did not feel supportive to who I was becoming, and I felt that the the thing that I wanted to do in being in being active and being socially engaged was to dimensionalize people mm. so that so that you can't help but extend or you can't help but start to see yourself somewhere where you maybe didn't, and then if you if someone becomes human to you, if something's humanized to you, it's much 
it's much harder to dismiss it or to dismiss them. It's much harder to dismiss their suffering, to dismiss their what what their needs and to dismiss what your who where you are in relationship to them. So that's really driven my life. Mm-hmm. It's been a part of the choices I've made as an actor. It's you know, I've I've chosen to develop in terms of the conversations I've wanted to be involved in as an artist. Um, I did theater for a long time and sort of cultivated my voice that way. And a lot of it was for the sake of, you know, what do I want to say? If if something with visibility ever should come my way, what would I what would I want to say? What would I want to be a part of? What would that project be that I would want to um, lend myself to? It has been such an incredible blessing and, and such a and it, 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 mind blowing to to experience that exact thing happening with this project because it's literally been what I've been orienting myself towards for a long, long time. And I feel that it's, it's, it holds within it all the conversations that I don <laughs> don the girlfriend mm-hmm. and down for, I'm interested in having, I'm constantly, you know, leaning into. Outside of sort of, you know, that professional realm, I'm a really chill person. <laughs> I don't know how else <laughs> to say it. I enjoy, like, I, I typically don't live in the middle of cities. You know, I, I typically enjoy being a little outside of the melee and loving my time, loving self-care is a big thing for me. Paying attention, being able to listen and be quiet is really important to mm-hmm. me. I'm, I'm the one who is usually, I think my castmates would say this, I'm usually the one who's rallying, you know, morale. And I'm, I'm the cheerleader. I'm the one who's in some ways trying to take care of, of, of others. And, and I think maybe that's why I find it important to, to be able to take care of myself and, and be in, a, be in a, an environment where I can really attend to myself. Because I spend a lot of my time doing that with other people. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm that. I'm a crazy family person. Wow, <laughs> like, awesome. with my- all the time. Yeah, very, very, you know, Charlie lives a huge life. I think I live a version of that life in terms of the public part of that life, Mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily prefer how she rolls. She rolls hard and she rolls with a lot of expectation constantly. And her RPM is impressively high impressively mm-hmm. high that's not my preferred <laughs> that's not my preferred uh-huh. state you know but she's fun to play because of that she's fun to play wow what is it what does a typical weekend look like for dawn hmm a typical weekend that's actually been hard to say since the, in the last year and a half because honestly that we've been doing the show and then even when we're off when when we've wrapped, we've been doing press so much, so it, it's it's hard to actually find a typical weekend. Um, lately, I think it's been downtime. You know, I do mm. a lot of um, a lot of massage walks in the park. You know, a lot of deep down regulating. I guess is the way I want to say it. Um, a lot of slowing myself, my own my own RPM down when I when I'm on the weekend because there's there's if it's a weekend that I'm not doing press or if it's a weekend that I'm not traveling for a business reason, um, because, because my business is so unexpected and, um, and has a certain kind of pace and expectation of responding to everything that's happening in the world, to be honest with you. Um, and that can be a little overwhelming. So when I have time to myself, I can be really just with myself and my family. It's, it's, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a simpler I'm a simpler human than I think Charlie can let herself be sometimes, but it's a lot of downtime, a lot of downtime, very chill. I love that. And so I I see, I see moments of Dawn and Charlie where Charlie does silence herself so that she can really identify with what she's doing and her why. And I see her sort of picking that up as she takes on the mission of really empowering all the farmers in the town. And I think that's so important because I hear the mission driven part of you and Charlie, Charlie is relentless. I mean, Charlie is there's, I don't think she believes in no. Does Don believe in no? <laughs> <laughs> that 
that is a very, very good thing to say about Charlie. That is such an accurate statement. I don't think she no, believes in it. No, it's not an option. I think she believes not yet. I think she believes not in not yet. yet. You know, her no, <laughs> no. Well, we'll see. You know, I think it's one of the greatest lessons that I've been learning from Charlie. I think Dawn's accepted a little more no than she's wanted mm-hmm. to, to be honest with you. And I think it's something that I that I have been grateful for in playing this character. Because you're right, she is relentless. And as exhausting as that can be sometimes, I admire it. Like, like I admire it so deeply. It's It's funny because I both can be critical of her and I have to really catch myself and really, I don't know, watch myself with it because it, it, I think she can be easy to mm-hmm. judge. She's very flawed. She she does not do the ideal thing. Right. And as a woman right now, I think that's an important thing to see is a woman who's not, she's not asking for permission. She's taking up space and she's really comfortable taking up space. And I think it's, I think it's a really important thing to see. I know for me, I've had to step into a new level of, of comfort in that. I've had to, I've had to expand my, my, my comfort zone in taking up that much space and playing this character. And I think it's, I think it's bleeding over into my life in a very good way because I'm, I'm so, I'm already so um, attentive, mm-hmm. you know, to, to listening and to being present in a way that's fair, in a way that's, that I really want to see other people. You know, that's really a big part of my life. And this part of, you know, the mission that I've been in is sort of creating spaces for people to have space, mm-hmm. <laughs> especially for people who haven't taken up a lot of space before or feel that they are not allowed to take up space socially, you know, historically, all kinds of things. So I, I think for me, I tend to want to create spaces for other people. I tend to want to create an environment of listening and safety and, and collaboration and all these things that are really good and, and we can create from, and, you know, there's, it's great in terms of a creative space, but it's, it's actually harder to take up mm-hmm. my own space. That's, so I, I feel like I've been learning and playing this character, just how important that is to take ownership of that, to be unapologetic about it and to, uh, to, to risk others' discomfort because Lord knows Charlie does yes. all the time. <laughs> And uh-huh. she really does. She, it's like, you see, I think out of everybody in the show, you see her in uncomfortable spaces or, or risking uncomfortable spaces in extreme, extreme ways. And I think that that's actually an important thing for women to be doing and to be seen doing right now. So I, I'm, I'm definitely um, taking my notes as I play this character. <laughs> I think I we learn it. a lot from, you know, Charlie's example in that she's not what you would consider a typical basketball wife, right? So she has this her agenda oh. is is stronger than than what what we typically see in TV and it's such a good timing on that because we need these new examples of women who can um reflect the power of who they are and she's going back to this town and she's taking everything that she's gained from making lemonade out of that marriage and now she's walking into town with her resources and she's putting put, putting them forward in an effort to kind of save the family legacy. But uh, there's also this side of Charlie that I see that, um, you know, she wants to, to have this soft, sensual connection with Remy. She wants that to be able to, um, you know, almost be as, as careless and carefree as everyone else has been, you know, in a sense of the way they live, but she has this, the mantle is on her shoulder. And so there's a complex side of her that's like, as much as I'd like to be wild or I'd like to make, you know, reckless decisions or have the free side, she doesn't really have permission. Do you feel like um, Charlie is now moving into a space and I'm probably asking for more than you may offer, but where she's done with asking permission, she's now wearing her hair natural. You know, her mom's like, oh, I like your hair this way. You know, (laughs) it's like she's done with sort of requiring the permission and she's, she's now taking on, you know, I think I'm, I'm asking, do you feel like Charlie is taking on more freedom now as the uh, show evolves more so that she doesn't have to require permission as much, or is she still, you know, walking on a few of those eggshells that we tend to walk on as women? Well, I think she has an interesting relationship with control because I think that That's what we saw in season one is that there was nothing typical about this basketball wife. In fact, when I was 
when I was researching before we started shooting and I was sort of building her and I was looking at all of these, you know, different sort of sources, I was watching documentaries. And then I also checked out Basketball Wives because I was like, well, there's a show called Basketball Wives. Uh-huh. Let me see what that's about. And I remember watching one episode and being like, she's nothing like, she's nothing like any of the women that I saw in that episode. She, I just remember thinking like, maybe on the outside, but nothing about the way that she operates is like that. So what I watched, what I ended up watching were all these examples of women in business, women in in positions where they're the first woman doing what they're doing, because that is really, it's almost like the basketball wife Mm -hmm. was a great bait and switch. It's like if if she can appear to be that basketball wife, people actually might underestimate her. And meanwhile, she's running the show. She's absolutely got... I mean, Davis, that entire enterprise, that entire Mm -hmm. image was her creation. She created it. And then I think, you know, what happens in season one is when that crumbles, I think her sense of control both is challenged and is heightened. She both wants to like Mm -hmm. really take control of her life because she's just lost it. But there's something happening, I think, unconscious that we see more, much more of in season two, which is a freedom that comes from losing control of her life. Um, so I, will she do more of that? I think we're going to watch forever with her, her have this Mm. push pull relationship with control. I think what we're seeing her do is evolve. We're seeing her, um, recognize what that kind of control cost her in her former life, including losing track of Micah a bit. You know, one thing that I talked about in the last season, which prompted really where they went this season in terms of the writing was how Micah really there's a world in which if, if Charlie and Davis had kept going the way they were going because she was so relentless and she was so involved in his, uh, in Davis's career, Micah could have gotten, give it a year, two years. You know, he could have been that 17, 18 year old. Mm -hmm. Who's just that crazy rich kid on sunset in LA who obnoxious and awful and, and in jail in two years because they were, not paying attention. And so I think she has been confronting what that control and what that that intense, relentless um, rigidity mm-hmm. has has cost her. And then, you know, on top of that, the loss of the land, I think, was the next sort of the floor floor left from under her. And so what I'm always, Dawn is always excited for those huge shifts in character, those huge, um, extreme circumstances, because I think that's where we see a character make decisions Mm -hmm. about who they are and who they're becoming. I really think that that's where, where, where we see critical points of change and where we lean in as, as, as people accepting or receiving a story, because isn't that what we're really doing? We're just sort of seeing ourselves and seeing our own sort of evolution play out or seeing our own heroism come to the front when we didn't think it would or or maybe our own destruction as a result of of a mistake and you know but how do we rebuild from that so i i i can't say that it it, i would prefer her to go in a direction because honestly i think part of what her her fun is and her gift is is the unexpected it's it's like (laughs) out of everyone she is making she's making the most unexpected moves mm-hmm. and then also i think meeting herself in unexpected ways and i think that's part of the, the joy in, in watching her <laughs> i couldn't i couldn't agree more <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And then you have the dynamic of, okay, we've got siblings and every sibling is totally different. Yet everyone wants to have the power to use their voice to control yeah. what's happening <laughs> in the family. <laughs> yes. That's a great way to put it. That's a really good way to put it. Well, it's true. And Ralph Angel really feels like he's qualified, but I mean, you know, Charlie and Nova both agree on the fact that he's not quite there yet. Um, But, you know, um, but as siblings, you still have to look at the interest of the family legacy. And I think that's what Queen Sugar really reflects, especially in our African-American community. Legacy is so valuable for us to really take a hold of and do whatever it takes, whatever is necessary to preserve our legacy, because it's so rich. And if we can use it and you can teach Micah the legacy and Micah can then teach the next generation. Is that something that you guys are very intentional about in terms of how the characters are 
grabbing a hold to the legacy. It seems like Ralph Angel sort of late to the legacy party. Then you've got Nova, who is, is who's very very much woke. Nova is completely woke, but she's had she has these um, alternative relationships that you know kind of conflict with with her um, with her fist in the air. And then we have you, who it's I think Charlie's more um, power driven. Than more so than legacy driven. So I'm kind of curious: is that something that you guys have so, sort of sculpted in the in the characters, or is that just the way it's playing out for the viewer? That was an amazing summation of all of the characters and their relationship <laughs> with legacy. That was really awesome. You know, I think. Uh, oh boy, we we have not really talked I would say a lot to each other about legacy like as, as a cast we're, we're not constantly talking about you know how is how is the story about legacy or how are we all um, participating in in legacy but it seems it ha- it feels like individually for whatever reason we've all leaned into it and I know that I think that Charlie's relationship with legacy I think that's part of part of what we're watching. We're watching her evolve into wanting and fighting for more than herself. And I think just really from episode one on, we see her from the mo- from when she loses her father, we see her realize how inattentive she's been to that conversation, really. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like her own legacy is what she's been, <laughs> been most attentive to, but not the legacy of her family or her father. And I think we're seeing her begin to link them or become conscious of that link because I don't know if they're ever unlinked, really. And I think it's a huge conversation in Black families. I know for me, in my own family, literally right now, the the conversation is about my grandmother, my grandmother's land and my grandmother's house. I mean, lit- these these conversations dominate my family experience, really. And I don't know if that's really every family always, but... I know for for black families because of our uh histories and because of what we have walked with and walked through how we continue forward it it, it dominates my mind for sure and I think that there's been an un, unarticulated conversation in terms of this generational it's a bit of a chasm you know I know that there are young people who really don't have a relationship with either the civil rights movement or um, just a, an upper generation, a much older generation who walked in a very different world. And, and it's not because we want to constantly live in the, in the past. It's because by being connected with that understanding, what you have come from, it informs really, you know, what you want to see moving forward and what your, what, what, what your vision is for yourself and your community. So I, I feel it's it's our, the show is articulating all of those characters and all all of their sort of relationships with legacy. I think it's articulating a larger communal cultural relationship with legacy that that that's happening. And I I I feel like exactly what you just said that each each character feels like they have the vo- the best voice <laughs> at times or should should be heard. And I, I remember talking with, I can't remember who it was. It might've been a cast member or it might've been another interview. But the way I began to see it is like when Ernest passes, really it's almost like every family member has to come to the plate at some point. You see that through season one, you see it into season two. And, and either it's because they're being asked by a circumstance to come to the plate, to, to lead, to be the coach, to lead the team, or it's because they are feeling it's time for them to come to the plate. It's time for them to take the lead. And I think part of what you're seeing is this family, the family itself, the Bordelone family itself, it's like its own entity evolving. And it requires that people bring their strengths. And now I lead. And now you can't lead because of whatever happens. And now I lead. And and I think that we're seeing that in Black society and Black cultures and in mm-hmm. Black families in general. I really do. Um, I think Black Lives Matter is a good example of that. It's a leaderless movement. So there is an ask. There is a, what do you have to bring? What do you have to contribute? When is, when is it your time to step to the plate and say, actually, my voice needs to be heard now? I think there, there, there's a conversation about sort of meeting, 
I don't know if meeting, it sounds a little cliche to say meeting your destiny, but definitely meeting your potential and meeting the person that, that you want to be, the person that you, that you can be. And that, that sort of being nurtured and cultivated in, in this family, you know, I think that that's, that's at least yeah. been the way that I've been thinking about it lately. Mm, I love that. What has it taken, Dawn, for you, the woman, to get to the place where you are today? What are some of the challenges you've had to overcome? Mm. To be honest with you, I think the, the biggest conversation and the biggest thing that I've, I've walked with is both a worth conversation and a feeling mm-hmm. of where is my place. Um, I think when I, when I left school, you know, having made this decision, I am going to be an actor. That's, that's what I've decided to do. And then facing the, res- the response from the business as I was graduating, it was so painful at that time. This was, you know, this is a, long, a while ago, over 10 years ago. And, and at that time, it, it was not, you know, Obama hadn't come into office we hadn't had this this surge of oh being mm-hmm. mixed is cool like it just that was not the experience that I had it was it was much more being mixed is really confusing to us and um, we don't really know where to place you or to put you or you're not this enough you're not that enough we just don't know what to do with you and that was that was our sort of like you know it was almost like an exaggerated experience that I'd had much of my life and um, growing up and I think in some ways I internalized it for a long time. And then I got to a point where I decided, I, I began to ask myself, what do I want to do with me? Not just what do you want to do with me, but what do I want to do with me? And I began to pursue those conversations. I began to, you know, choose projects in theater, especially that would develop me as an artist that, um, you know, one of the directors of this season, actually, Luzel Tommy, she directed one of those projects at, um, at OSF Ruined. And it was, it was just to choose a road that felt like I would be able to develop what I had to say and a voice that I, that was mine and that I, that I felt had a certain amount of integrity in it. And that was hard. That means, you know, um, going, you know, that meant for me leaving LA and going and doing theater in, in places that, you know, people weren't really aware of or just making unconventional decisions uh professionally and not sort of taking roles in projects often it wasn't even the roles just the project itself I was just like I can't I just can't I can't I don't I'm not down with that for whatever reason and then often it was a role that was like you know the exotic this or the um just sexualized things that were sexualized in ways that I just I just wasn't down with sometimes and you know so it it really has been like a, a a conversation about where is my place and and not in a what place do do does anyone else have for me but in a what place do I want to make for myself and you know it's sort of like well I was already dealing with this in my life and being biracial and and sort of walking all these cultural lines and trying to figure that out for myself I guess I better apply it to my career and better um take ownership of that of that conversation of that walk and then the other part of it is a worth conversation. I think that this is a harder thing to articulate and talk about as a woman, especially. But I think that it can be very, it can be very tough to say, mm. I deserve this. It can be very tough to say, um, mm. you know, I, I am enough. Really, literally, I am enough. And I don't need the approval of, anyone or anything outside of me. And that can be, that can be, and, and I don't know, a role, an agency, a pro, and especially in my business, yeah. approval coming from the outside is sort of the culture. <laughs> it's the, yeah. especially actor culture. It's very sort of like, tell me I'm okay. And for me, that has been very tricky and very, um, it's a very subtle conversation. It's not a popular one. There's something sexy about it, but it's definitely been my, the core conversation I've walked in is constantly moving towards a place of wholeness and being enough and giving from that place and creating from that place. I I've just recently begun talking to girlfriends about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I feel like it's something that we're literally all struggling with. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing it play out right now in the conversation that Hollywood's having. 
And I, I feel like it's, it's an important, like the most important thing about it is that people take ownership of it for themselves. It's not for other people to agree with you. It's not for the people to, to, to necessarily have a, a movement of people who are like, get everybody to agree that we should have self-worth. It's like, take, <laughs> you know, take it on, take on that conversation yourself. And that's the change, you know, cliche again, but that's the change that you want to see in the world. Take that, really take on that conversation. That I feel like is, it's, it's an un sort of acknowledged torpedo for, for lives sometimes. Like I've watched friends and I've done it myself where that conversation can really sabotage even a good thing. So Mm -hmm. I take that conversation on and I take it and I take it seriously. And I am taking it on knowing that I, I think, I think me taking it on myself will affect others taking it on in themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. You talked about before you said that you were like the cheerleader among the cast in in your life. Who's, who's been your biggest cheerleaders? Oh man. I think the first people who've been my biggest cheerleaders, and I am so blessed that this is the case because I know this isn't always the case, are my parents. Really, my mother never, ever said I could not, I, I should not or could not or, or yeah, I should not pursue this. She, I never really heard her say, you can't do that. You just can't do that about almost anything. And I, I recognize now just how, how incredibly powerful that was. Um, and I don't think she set out to say, I'm never going to tell my child she can't do something. I think it was, it's part of her nature. It's part of her nature, um, not even necessarily for herself, but just to believe in people and to believe in, in possibility and to believe that, yeah, yeah, it's, it's possible. Just if you can have the vision and you can have the focus, it can, it can happen. You can, it, it's possible. It's just, it's possible. And so that was downloaded into me pretty early. Um, and I just, and even from my larger family, all I heard was even if nothing awesome was happening or there was nothing, you know, high profile happening, it was just so, what are you into and what are you doing? Oh, that's so cool. Or what's that? It was just always such an, a genuine interest. There was never judgment ever. And I think that's where, where I get that from. And I, and I really mean that I, I count that as a blessing because I, see up close with other people, just how difficult it can be if that's not, that that's not the case. And then uh, my, you know, I'm engaged and my fiance is my, oh, is my, is my <laughs> so um, I'm very lucky in that way too, is that when I tell you he's a cheerleader, like anyone who ever meets him is like, yeah, he's a, uh, he's got your back in a way that is, that is rare and is, um, is beautiful. And he's the other half of, of me. So I'm, that's- I'm, um, I am so grateful for that because I know that that can also be rare. And it, and it's also, it's like a, he's a, <laughs> he is such a giving presence, but he's also a fighter. He, he fights for me. And that's, I think, um, I, I'm just every night, every time I think about it, I'm just like, wow, I'm so lucky that the, my person, my, my, my significant other literally will will fight me on myself will will fight for the best the best for me even when i'm not seeing the best for me he will fight for it oh so, i love him that's so awesome. <laughs> that's so <beautiful. laughs> me too <laughs> he's a good one congratulations um Thank so it, this is my um, i think my last question for someone if you have another one but oprah ava you know, you're working and you have the opportunity to really, really help to change the face of television. I, I really do believe that in terms of what Queen Sugar offers in the narrative and who you yes. align with. Um, yes. Was this something that you saw in the legacy of your career? Is this something that you ever dreamed of? Or, you know, how did, you know, is this like, was this on a board somewhere? Is this just kind of <laughs> what happens when you're great at what you do? <laughs> you know, I will say that Interestingly, about, I would say four, three, three years, maybe three to four years before getting Queen Sugar, um, I got very, very clear. And part of why I got very clear is I had a huge loss. I, I lost someone to suicide mm-hmm. and it, it, it sparked really a, a year of deep reflection and inner work, personal work. It was a hugely important person in my life. and. 
I think from that experience, because because it, until that happens, I think somewhere it's like, yeah, we we all live and then we and then we die, and then you realize like, no, it's a choice. Mm-hmm. It's a choice to be here, and so then it becomes well. Then if I'm choosing to be here, what am I doing? What what am I really doing here? What am I really wanting to do here? What am I? What do I feel my my particular life is for? Uh, and I began to dive into months of of just asking that question and diving into that question. And as I did that, I began to get very clear about that vision. And specifically about the kind of work that I wanted to be a part of, about the people that I wanted to to work with. And it wasn't necessarily like, it's Ava DuVernay and it's Oprah Winfrey, but, it's, but it was like, I want to create, I literally said this, I had it on my wall. I want to make game-changing, socially relevant, powerful uh, theater, film, and television with uh, people with, with excellence and with high level people who are aligned with my mission and values. Like that's what I literally wrote and said. And then like Queen Sugar happened. And it was years later, cause I'd said that without any sort of evidence of seeing that in my life, but I just stated it and dreamt of it and worked, worked, did my work. And, um, and then years later, Queen Sugar came across my desk and I, I was stunned after reading the script by how much it resonated with every part of me and every part of that, those, the, that, you know, what I, what I said to myself those years ago and the fact that it was being led by two of my heroes was, was just mind blowing. It was mind blowing. And then, um, to actually get it. <laughs> like, it was one thing to even audition. One thing to even then to just meet Ava it was like, I'm done. I'm good. But bucket list check. Like I've got that. <laughs> to meet her was a check. I'm good. And then to get it, it was just like shock. All of last year was just shock. The, the entire year was shock. So I feel like um, I, I have a dual experience. I, I both, I both dreamt, prayed for, and you know, willed into existence, or at least my involvement in this project into existence, and was completely shocked and had to orient to the reality of it because it was shocking. But I feel like the shock part of it is, has, has worn off. And I'm, I'm now in the um, embracing part of it. I don't know if that answered your question. No, but- perfectly. No, perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, because I think, again, like those two people, I think what, what it has moved from is like this sense of these two giants. You know, I was thinking the other day, Oprah has been in television for I th- almost as long as I've been alive. You know what I mean? She has, she has, I don't know if there's anyone who has had as much influence as she has had in culture in television, in how people really have conversations with themselves and in such a popularized way. She's it just like, she's such a force. And to be on a television show that's on her network is, is really, it, it just doesn't stop being mind blowing, mind blowing. And then Ava is, is a, a force and a revolutionary. And to be a part of a project that is so mission driven and her agenda is so easy to get on, on board with and, and aligns with mine. And, you know, it's, it's an easy, it's an easy um, thing to say yes to. So it's been, it's now moved from sort of like mind blown to education. They're, they're such they're, they're like a classroom. It's such a classroom to be in, in this kind of proximity to them, to see what, how powerful clear intention is, because that's what they are masters of, both of them. And, um, and I, it's, it's, it's having like an, 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 a front row seat and taking lots of notes. I love that. You're taking great notes. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to catch them as soon as they come. So we're all excited. The season uh, finale is coming on Wednesday, and this actually will be releasing the day of the finale. So we'll have all our girlfriends setting their DVR to really to see Boy. how Charlie's going to shut down this season and leave us hanging again. <laughs> Oh boy! All I have to say is buckle up. It's um, it it's uh, it leaves no no. It, it's oh yeah. boy! <laughs> wow! Yeah, yeah. Packs a lot oh of punches. Goodness. We're ready for, sure. for it, and we can't thank you enough again. The entire the show is just fantastic. It's so well casted. Every person is perfect for their their role. It's just been amazing to just see the evolution of each character and, and some of the dynamics that they face. And these are real to, to every single person's life. And womanhood especially, we can all identify with some of the things that you and Nova um, and Darla in her own special way, you know, the, some of the things that she's going through um, and, and Aunt Vi, I mean, my God. So we, we really feel connected to it. And it, it really does help us as women uh get answers in some sort of way. We see solutions. We see problems, but we see solutions as well. And those family dynamics and the half siblings and the divorce, you know, all the, the things that are real to life. So it's it's so much better than us having to watch reality TV. It's a real drama. <laughs> it takes us into real places that we can actually uh, relate to. So we're excited for season three for you all. And um, thank you so much for sharing your your womanhood with us today. It has been such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dawn. Oh, I'm sorry. Where, where can um, our girlfriends catch you on social? Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, um, at Dawn Lien. Uh, so you can catch me there. I'll be there. So that was amazing. Absolutely. Wow. I think I'm a super fan now. I think I'm a big fan, too. <laughs> no. Not just on screen, but off screen. Like she really could be at the movie night or at dinner on vacation. She's really a girlfriend. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she was so incredible. I love it. And you could feel her spirit like through the phone. It was really amazing. So good. Well, we'd like to close out by thanking our husbands. Kwaku, I love you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Rich Daniel. By the time this episode comes back out, I'll finally be back in New York. Yay! He has been missing the love of his life. Come on. <laughs> and Sam and Dylan, thank you so much. And to this guy, our future great girlfriends. Yes, and who I haven't seen in forever, but that's a whole other conversation. And to all of you great girlfriends, thank you for trusting us as your go-to source for everything life, love, and laughter. Make sure you listen every Wednesday on iTunes, Stitcher, Podcast Bean, Podcast Republic, Spotify, iHeart, and every other podcasting service. Absolutely. And please check us out on social, on our Instagram. The Great Girlfriends. Facebook. The Great Girlfriends. On our Twitter. The underscore great GFS. And please join our Facebook group to connect with all of the hundreds of thousands of other amazing great girlfriends we have around the world. I love that. Post your questions online, share with your friends, keep listening, and keep being a great girlfriend. I'm Sybil. And I'm Brandis. And we are signing off. Love you guys. Peace.